Hello and welcome to another edition of James and Chris Science Videos where today we're going to be looking at energy. We're going to be looking at the definition for energy, we're going to be looking at different examples of energy and we're going to be looking at energy in food. Now let's start with the definition as shown by Wikipedia and the definition shown by Wikipedia is that energy is the capacity to do work. So what does that mean? Well if, if we want anything to happen energy is what makes that happen. So if we want something to move, we need energy. If we want something to heat up, we need energy. For every task we need, we need energy in order to make that task happen. So let's look at energy in a bit more detail. It, we're going to start off with, it can be stored or it can be active. We're going to look at the different types. We're going to see which ones can be active, which ones can be stored in a minute. Uh, but I quickly want to go on to um, this guy here. It seems like every Victorian scientist needed to have a beard need to be in their 50s and 60s. This is James Prescott Joule and James Prescott Joule worked with heat and he was the first person really to quantify how much energy is needed to heat up various different liquids and so Joule came from his work that he did back then. Now to give some context to the value of a Joule I've taken this again from Wikipedia and these are some of the examples of what one Joule would equal. So one joule would be the amount of energy required to lift a two kilograms, two bags of sugar, and to accelerate it to a speed of one meter per second. It is the energy to lift a medium-sized tomato up one meter, that is assuming approximately 100 grams. Um, we've got a bit about acceleration. We've got the heat to rise the temperature of one milliliter of water, it's one centimeter cubed of water, by 0 0.24 degrees Celsius. We're going to come back to that one and some other examples that are listed at the bottom. So I've highlighted this, the heat required to raise the one milliliter of water by 0 0.24 degrees Celsius. In basic terms, this means to raise one centimeter of water by one degree, I'm gonna need roughly four joules. And we're gonna come back to that as we go through this lesson. So let's look at energy inside of food. And to do this, we're going to have a little investigation on some watsits. And that's going to require me going over to the lab and seeing what Mr. Kipax is up to. So I'll see you in the lab in a minute. Right, I'm starting out the corridor today because I want you to see this. Because this is why, in the science department, we never get the equipment sorted. Because they're always being used and eaten by Mr. Kipax. So uh, look at this, look at this. You see that through the door. We'll get, we'll get him started. All right, Mr. Kipax, are you ready? Are you eating the Watsons again? Hmm? Always. Oh, no oh, wonder oh, oh, No oh, wonder we can't find I was just reading about Norwich being top of the league. Wow, yeah, that's, that's oh, lovely, yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah. You shouldn't eat lab, actually. No, you shouldn't eat my Watsons because I end up having to buy loads extra. Mm. That does make me think, actually. Um, over my time here, uh, I seem to be developing and expanding uh, waistline. I've done a lot to reduce it, but it seems to be uh, expanding again. And I'm wondering if this particular uh, brand of crisps might be responsible for the increasing in my waistline. Mr. Hardy, these are really good. Mm. Mm. What's, the, what's the best before on those? Um, I won't, I don't know, I mean, you might. I, <laughs> I, I, I trust my digestive system. Thank you very much. Anyway. As I keep putting on weight, it does make me wonder just how much energy is in one of these little crisps. And you look at it, you think, how much do you get in the packet? Loads and loads and loads. It can't actually be that much uh, energy in this. There is a way of finding out. What we can do is, much like our bodies, when we eat this and digest it, we're actually releasing all of the chemical energy inside here that runs our systems. We can do a quick, short way of doing that, and we can set light to this crisp. It will burn a lot, lot more than you think it would, and it will release the chemical energy into uh, thermal energy, and we can use that uh, thermal energy to heat some water. If we heat the water, we can work out how much the temperature of the water has gone up, and from that we can work out how much energy was in one tiny little crisp. Maybe not that one. I, I imagine mm. it's quite important to practice and find out Sorry, one of these, right. If we run oh. out of crisps. If we run out of crisps. Mm. Now, uh, we're going to use this one because it's got a lovely letter. I like. I quite like the shape of that crisp. It's brilliant. We're going to use this crisp. We're going to set right to it. We're going to use a volume. Mm. I, I fancy another one. Um, 
Uh, we're going to set light to it. We're going to find out how much uh, energy is released from this and, uh, uh, and then work out how much energy per tiny little crisp. One thing we could do before we started is to also weigh this crisp and find out how much per gram. But we'll come back to that one perhaps later. So this is our crisp. We're going to burn it and we're going to heat a specific volume of water. For this, we must know how much water we're using. There's no point in just filling this one up and guessing. We need an accurate measurement. And for accurate measurements, always use a measuring cylinder. So we're gonna use and choose, well, we choose to do 20 millilitres of water. So very carefully, I'm just going to fill up my measuring cylinder a little bit faster. And then as it's approaching 20, just drop down. Okay, and I'm happy that that is pretty much oil water. We'll pop that into our boiling tube here on our clamp stand, nice and gently, and pour the water in. Now, each time I do this experiment to make it, um, make it fair, I'm always going to use exactly the same amount of water. I'm going to use 20 millilitres. Now, what I could do now is set light to my crisp. I could eat it but I'm not going to, I'm gonna eat the rest of the packet later. Um, I could just set light to this, heat it up, and then look at the temperature rise, but I would have made one simple mistake, and that is I must know the temperature of the water before we start, otherwise we're into guesswork. So I'm just gonna pop that into there, nice and safely, and just leave it there for a few seconds so it stabilizes, and then we can read the start temperature off. So reminding, one crisp, 20 millilitres of water, and a temperature at the start of 15, 16 degrees C. So we're gonna pop that down onto a table so that we don't forget. <coughs> so on the first time we do the experiment, our starting temperature was 16. I've got the degrees C already into the table. So 16 is the, the uh, start temperature. We're now gonna go ahead and we're going to set light to the crisp we're going to burn it, um, we're going to release the chemical energy and we're going to turn that into thermal energy and measure the temperature rise of our water. Right there. Crisps out the way. Only because it's not dangerous, it's just I'm getting far, far, far too fat. Safety glasses on and um, some device for making a Bunsen burner would be very, very good. Could you turn my gas on there please, Mr. Hardy? Check we're on safety flame, nearly. Whoa. Okay, with everything in line there. If I was to do this experiment later, I would weigh my crisps so I could get the idea of the total energy in this crisp. Now, actually, just made me think um, to get this into the right place. We're going to have it nice and close, and now I'm ready to go. So I'm going to pop the Bunsen burner up a little bit higher. As soon as I get the crisp lighted, and it is quite some, quite amazing just how much one crisp will burn and how much uh, energy is released. Uh, temperature of the thermometer, I'm just going to pop that one out. And there, and off we go. So into the flame, I'm going to light, and you can see it doesn't take very much effort at all before this crisp is burning. And no wonder I am getting such an increased waistline when one tiny little crisp will burn this much. You think when you eat the crisps, this is the energy that will come out with one. And I don't eat just one. So there it is. Pop the thermometer back in. You'll notice there's an awful lot of carbon come out from the burning under the boiling tube. I'll let you clean that one later, Mr. Hardy. Thanks. That's all right. You're welcome. Now, um, it may surprise. It surprises me every time I do this just how much the temperature has gone up. And it may not be clear but we now have a temperature of 27, pushing up 28 degrees C. That's a quite substantial increase. Let's tap that one down. Safety. 28 degrees C. Grab my pen to left on the desk. So, one crisp. Started at 16 up to 28 degrees, which gives us a rise in temperature of 12 
degrees of one crisp. And remember that the volume of water was 20 BMC. Okay. So we've left Mr. Kipax stuffing his face full of what's it, and we've come back and we're just going to do a little bit of working out. Now, we saw that the water that he heated up rose by a certain amount. Now, there's a little bit of background information. We, we said that each milliliter of water would raise by one, um, sorry, one joule would raise it by 0 0.24 centimeters. So four joules raise one milliliter of water by one degree Celsius. Now, for one crisp, we had a temperature change of 12 degrees Celsius, and we had a volume of 20 milliliters. So to work out the energy in the crisp, we take the 12 degrees temperature change, we times it by four, because each, each degree Celsius needed four joules. So that was 12 times four, and then we take the 20 milliliters of water, and we times that onto it. And so that gives us a value for our crisp of 960 joules. Now, a packet of crisps is more than one crisp. On average, Watsits have about 30 crisps in each packet. So if I'm going to look at the energy in a whole packet of crisps, I need to now times 30, which is the number of crisps, by the energy of one crisp. So that's 960. Roughly, we think there should be 30,000 joules, or 30 kilojoules. Remember, kilo means 1,000, so 30,000 joules, 30 kilojoules. Let's go back to the lab, and Mr. Kibax will explain a bit more about that. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. So what we've done, um, we've worked out from this simple combustion experiment of a crisp that one pack of uh, these crisps contains 30,000 joules of energy, or simplifying that to uh, dividing it by 1,000, that would be 30 kilojoules of, uh, of energy. How does that compare to the back of the packet? By law, all food in this country has to tell you exactly what the nutritional values are and if you read to the side of this one, it says it's slightly different. And it says Wait, it is. Let me have a look at it. 376 kilojoules per pack. So there is an enormous difference between the data we've got at 30 kilojoules uh, per packet and the actual answer is 376, quite a massive factor out. But that's not a great surprise because of the equipment that we've used. There's an awful lot of wasted heat here, a lot of uh, blackness under here, which would reduce our efficiency. Um, that's not a, a great, great surprise. What is a great surprise is that you've got 376 kilojoules in one packet of crisps, and that's beginning to explain quite a bit on the waste slide. So what does that actually mean? According to our data, one packet of these crisps would heat up that amount of water, the 20 mils, by 350 degrees, which is quite an extreme amount on its own, just that volume up by 350. But the manufacturer's data says, actually, no, you're wrong there. It's 3,500 degrees. So the water there up by 3,500 degrees for just one packet yummy crisps. Brilliant. So we've seen those results. We saw how inaccurate they were and how far we were off the real value of the crisps. So we need to look at how we can more efficiently and reliably um, look at energy in food. And to do that, we use something called a bomb calorimeter. And I've got a bomb calorimeter next to me here. Now, this bomb calorimeter looks very complicated, but basically all it is is the same experiment but covered in a form of insulation. And that form of insulation stops any heat escaping so that all of the heat is used to warm up that water. So it gives us a much more accurate, and it's this method that they use to produce those values on the crisp packet. And so here is a crisp packet um, that says nutritional values. And one of the columns there says, uh, do per 24, 2.5 grams that's one pack now to compare foods it's not fair to compare the size of each different food because a chocolate bar will be a different size to a packet of crisps which will be a different size to a whole uh, mcdonald's beef burger 
And you can see scientists to make a fair comparison put it to 100 grams and that gives us a comparison we can use across everything. You see for the packet of crisps here is 2277 kilojoules. Um, it's got kilocalories below that's another unit that sometimes is used to measure energy and people talk about losing calories in their exercise. It's a similar measurement it measures energy. Now I want to stop for a second I want you to go in a second and to do a little kind of uh, judgment for me. Um, I would like you to head off to your kitchen. I want to look in the cupboard. I want to find the two examples of food that one provide the most amount of energy and two provide the least amount of energy and see with all the foods of what you get. Now you should be able to link this to a previous topic about food types and food groups and you should be able to tell me which food groups give you the most energy and which ones give you um, the least energy. So I'm going to stop the video there um, and come back in two seconds and then I'd like you to find those so that you can see the difference. Excellent, I hope you found the different packets. The foods with the most fat should be the ones with the highest amount of energy. The foods with the least amount of fat and carbohydrates should be the ones with the least amount of energy. If you manage to find some suet which is almost 100% fat, the amount of energy in that is quite astronomical. And so you, you talk to polar explorers and people like that, they pack suet as part of their sleighs. That's, that's the main food that they take. Now, let's, let's move this on, and we're going to start looking at different types of energy because we need to look at how we can quantify those energies and how we can start to discuss each type of energy. Now, I'm going to go through three types of storing energy. The first is something called gravitational potential energy. You can see someone diving off a high diving platform here. Um, the basic principle of this is the higher you go, the more energy you're building. So if I was to drop something from this high, it would hit the ground with a speed. Um, I, I don't know what the speed would be, but if I dropped it from here, the speed would be much bigger. So the higher I move it, the more genetic, uh, gravitational potential energy it has. And the lower it goes, the less gravitational potential it has. Second way I can store energy is in chemicals. Um, fuels are a great example of this. Fuels are generally made by plants photosynthesizing into sugars and then fossilizing. And all of that energy that they've stored gets stored in a hydrocarbon that we then burn. And so you can see here um, a big fire coming from a, uh, an oil fire. That would be chemical energy being stored and then released in different forms. The last type that we need to know about um, for this topic is the is elastic energy. And so again, very simple. If I stretch an elastic band, the more I stretch it, the more energy I've got in the elastic band. And when I let go, the harder it'll hurt when it hits my fingers or when I flick it at um, my daughter or my son, which is always good fun. Now, those are the storing energies, which means we can then turn them into energies that are doing energies. And with these doing energies, something is moving. Some kind of particle generally is moving in some kind of manner. So let's whiz through them. We've got light energy. Light is photons, tiny particles of photons moving at incredible speed. And so the more energy I give, the more light I can get out, and therefore the more photons that I shoot out in different directions. Heat energy, they're often linked with light. They're produced in a very similar manner. Um, heat energy is vibration of particles um, or movement of air particles in a certain speed. So heat energy is yeah, how quickly those particles are vibrating. Um, if I take away all of the energy and the particles stop moving entirely, we actually get to something called minus 273 degrees Celsius, which is called absolute zero. And you can't get colder than that because you can't have less energy than the particles being still. And that is, that is the least energy it can have. And so that will happen at minus 273 degrees Celsius. Sound energy is compression waves. It's, some, again, something vibrating. If I'm talking, you're hearing me through the air particles vibrating between me and the microphone. So sound energy. Electrical energy, little electrons moving around a wire, carrying a charge that, that can make other things happen. So electrical energy is another form of energy. And the last one is kinetic energy. And a kinetic energy is a physical object moving. So you can see here the roller coaster heading down the track, going around the bends. The, the, the actual roller coaster itself, that's what's got the kinetic energy. 
So let's summarise. Um, it's been yeah quite a long video. Um, we started off with a definition for energy and we looked at energy being the ability to do some work. We, we can measure energy in joules and usually heat is the easiest of the energies to measure. We just put in a thermometer. The other types of energies are sometimes harder to measure. Food contains lots of energy and we looked at how we can work out the energy in a food. Um, we looked at the different types of energy. We looked at the storing energies, so the three storing energies, uh, GPE, which we're going to say from now, we're not going to use gravitational potential energy because we're a bit lazy, GPE will do. Chemical and then elastic. There are ways of energy making particles move and those are the doing energies. We've got light, we've got heat, we've got sound, we've got electricity and we've got kinetic, which is a physical object moving. Thank you very much for listening. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.